In today's Elden Ring challenge video, another easy challenge because I don't actually have skill. I'm just here to flex my editing and beg for subscribers. I'll think of a hard challenge someday, please don't want to subscribe. Elden Ring has weapon skills ranging from downright useless to instant death. And these weapon skills can actually be divided into three categories. My other skill videos had a rule where I can only use skills that are a direct consequence of the skill button, specifically excluding weapon skills that require an additional input to deal damage. So today, we'll be going over only those skills and see how easy the game gets. Shall we begin? If you're new here, hi, I'm Player Yume. And to summarize, I'm basically Maxor, if Maxor was a brown Asian man with zero editing skills. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't subscribed already, this is the obligatory begging session. Please subscribe. In the Ibiningi, we start with the Samurai class, simply because they start with the Weeb stick, which includes Anshi. This skill is great, it reminds me of my activities with my favorite subscriber. Won't say who it is though. All facts aside, I walk my usual path with the goal of killing Grail. Do you know I have routes when recording these videos? It's mostly influenced by flask upgrades and stuff that I need for my build. In this path, our first destination is the Milk Dragon, which I Anshi that for about half an hour before she is satisfied. Since Anshi uses the weapon to attack, any effects that the weapon has gets imparted onto the enemy. So even if I run out of mana, I can still stack bleed on Grail, which is a really convenient mechanic, although it can't do anything when the game crashes. There goes 15 minutes of my life. Half an hour later, and with 90,000 runes, I got 22 strength and balanced out my health and endurance. After that, I got the stamped upward cut Ash of War, which is a pretty useless but funny skill. And before that comes a moral dilemma, because there's only one direct buff that benefits follow-up skills, which unfortunately comes from a sacrifice. But am I willing to lose subscribers for just a little bit more damage? Next, I took the Strength Knot Crystal Tier and continued on to Liurnia. Here, we mostly get Flask Upgrades and Sights of Grace, and most importantly, the Altus Plateau. Here, I can unlock more Flask Upgrades, the Volcano Manor, and the Great Star's Great Hammer, which is one of the stronger Great Hammers with lower requirements, and Bleed, just to be quirky and not like the other builds. I could put Upward Cut on this and utilize the Blunt Damage, which is most useful for hard enemies. You see, these weapon skills scale with Weapon Upgrade and Damage, so it's important to get my upgrades in check. So for this, I went to Celia Crystal Tunnel and bullied the Crystallian boss. And along with the other Bell and Altus, I can get my weapons up to plus 12, which is enough for now. Now that the damage part of my build is done, it's time to focus on stacking as much defense as possible, because I refuse to be held accountable for my mistakes and my crimes. We start by defeating Margit for the second talisman slot. And somehow, I took more L's in this fight than the families of my victims. It's really easy, but if you ask me how many times I died, I will lie to you. But anyways, this talisman slot will be permanently taken by the Dragon Crest Shield Talisman for a 10% damage negation. But now it's time to grind levels, so I can pump it all into Vigor. So I fought the Queen Rot Knight duo for the Gold Scarab Talisman, and then Patches for Golden Falfi, although I spared him this time for the quest that he'll give me later on. With Rune Boosters in hand, I fought the Farting Tree in Dragon Barrow. And this guy is actually... Well... He's kind of a... He one-shots me, but I'm a badass so I beat him anyway. Next, I initiated the Volcano Manor questline, which leads me to Old Knight Isvan. One friendly conversation later... And now I have his armor, which is actually the best defense you can get early game. Then comes even more rune grinding. So I fought Grail, a simple dragon fight that gives way too many runes. Although, I was having trouble with the way that upward cut works. It's really slow. And most of the hitbox is spread on your lower half, making it really hard to hit dragon heads. So I changed things up a bit and I upgraded my katana and used unsheathed instead. The heavy attack is a vertical slash that easily hits the head for 30 points damage. And let's just say, the dragon did not sheathe that coming. 
and with the runes, I bought the broadsword that comes with square off, which is basically unsheathed for anti-dex chads. Instead of having two similar slashes, square off has an upward cut and a heavy thrust attack. The cut comes out as fast as a light attack, and the thrust does pierce damage, which is a better version of standard damage. And with counter-attack damage, just to be quirky. I also got the Ash of War versions of these skills, situated in Limgrave and Siafra River. And while I was there, I also challenged the Great Jar, which I found was a horrible mistake. Turns out, the warriors copy the builds of the people that beat the challenge before you. So I had to fight against the cancer that you people made. And with a gigantic health bar at that, I'll just come back later. In Stormvale Castle, I went about my necessary business, and unlocked this room to get the Iron Wet Blade. I used this to put heavy on my katana and broadsword. And this is because the katana scales better with strength than the broadsword scales with dexterity. It feels illegal, but here's a heavy katana. Then comes Godric. On top of the weapon skills being powerful, I stacked a ton of levels beforehand. So it kinda just went like... Oh, my pussy! Oh. I used a good amount of money to buy boiled crab from my good friend Boggart, and I admit I was wrong for killing this guy so many times, but in my defense, I was dead ass. Next came progression. I wanted another talisman slot, so I unsheathed my appendage on a divorced woman. It felt like the right one to use, since Rinala likes to run away like I do when I'm presented with a problem. Since my load wasn't too big yet, I used the extra slot for the spear talisman, which gives me a boost to counter attacks. Though this only affects the heavy attack of Square Off if I hit it during an enemy's attack animation. With that done, it's time for Star Portage with Dan. This fight went well. It really highlights the difference between unsheathed and Square Off. The Unsheathed's best attack comes out faster, but Square Off has a slightly higher damaging heavy attack and a way faster light attack. I definitely prefer having access to both at a time. Fun fight! I continued the Volcano Manor questline, not just to satiate my unending lust for murder, but because I wanted to receive Patch's letter, which leads me to my next casualty. This bumbling rock hard buff man proves that anyone can be a victim. This fight is as simple as backing up and thrusting forward repeatedly. This leads to my psychotic impulses being rewarded once more by the bull goat armor, the highest general defense in the game. I'll be switching out pieces of my set as I go about leveling endurance, but for now, I entered offline mode and challenged the jar warriors again. This time there's a lot less cancer and it feels doable. Really says a lot about society. And now comes the Draconic Tree Sentinel. I always knew this guy had low poise, but I didn't know it was exactly 60, as I'm always staggering him in two hits. He also pulled out this really quick follow-up attack that I have never seen before. It honestly felt like the game just pulled that out of its ass. Amazing game design, really. With Lindell unlocked, I waste no time getting through the main boss. For Godfrey, I use Unsheathed, because you only really get to do one attack with most weapons after he attacks. Also, if I remember Correctly, Godfrey is moderately weak to slashing damage. Fight was easy as ever and dropped faster than Elden Ring's player count. Morgoth was more of a battle of attrition. I'm at a stage of the game where the challenge weapons are neither overpowered nor weak, so Morgoth was instead a good test of moveset and how well I can use it to make my windows matter. With the unlock of the snowfields, I decided to commit racism by killing two omens that block my path to Morgoth's great rune. I used Morgoth's rune for a while for more health until I realized Radan's rune suits me better for its multi-purpose. I also got a smithing stone bell in the more ruins that gets my weapons up to plus 18. Next came the fire giant. Ah! This was just 10 minutes of pure boring. They did not have to remove his weakness mechanic in the second phase. It doesn't actually make the fight easier. It just keeps the fight reasonable. I use the katana here because this guy moves around way too much, so I need a quick snapping action for my opportunities. Next, I wanted to unlock the consecrated snowfield, so I fought Commander Nile. I was definitely too harsh on this guy, but after learning him a bit, it feels doable. While I don't think it's bullshit anymore, I still agree that it is frustrating to keep waiting and waiting and waiting for my turn that does 5% of his health bar. And now in the consecrated snowfield, I do my usual business of defeating Putrid Avatar, Theodorix, 
and the Astol for about 600,000 ruins. Then, I traveled to the Howley Tree and fought Royal Knight Loretta. She went down the same way the Tree Sentinel did, and now I have access to the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman. This would now finish my defense-based build with over 50 defense during fights. Now I would like to name this the Self-Love Build, probably the least used one in the community. With all this, it's time to initiate the endgame, starting with Moog, Lord of Alabama. This battle ain't quick, but it ain't quite slow either. So I use Unsheath at first, before I realize that some of the attacks have longer windup and some are super short, so after dying a couple times, I switched to square off. This gave me a more varied moveset and helped squeeze out more damage. Up next in the circus roster of endgame boss rush is the Godskin Duo. They're made of leather, so slash damage will do the trick. And although they may be difficult, one death is all it took for me to lose my composure and unleash my inner surgeon to cut down the two foreskins. Pretty easy the second time. My favorite boss comes next, and here it just felt like square off was the right thing to use. My dodging wasn't too good overall, but that's what it's all about. My vision had pretty much panned out the way I hoped. Good reliable damage and enough defense to say don't care After unlocking the ranked city, I went back to the outskirts to get the Urtree's favor. Pretty good talisman for most builds with an extra slot. Gideon actually deserves a spot in this video because I had a difficult time with him. I guess it's only fair. What do you expect from a fight where the entire joke is that he's a sorcery spammer? Godfrey will also have to be fought with Unsheathed. I got grabbed twice in the second phase, but it says so much about my build when I couldn't even care to notice the damage. Thank you builds are amazing. Radagon was simply satisfying. The openings just felt good enough to fit the heavy attack, and although I didn't do well, it definitely felt good. Had a bunch of gamer moments in there too. Oh shit. Oh! Elden Beast was way too easy. For how many critiques people have about this fight, I really find it the easiest to do. I was doing more damage than I expected, and that's a happy surprise for how little FP I'm consuming per attack. This was a really fun challenge, and I hope that you enjoyed the video even if it may not be up to the standard. I actually had a hard time making this one, and the next one may take long again, but I hope you're ready to see it. Thanks for watching.